real life superpowers. Oftentimes we think about like meaning and and passion for our work as, you know, once you have that, you will never work a day in your life. And that's, that's empirically and anecdotally false. And so, so recognizing that, that we can be our own worst enemies as entrepreneurs and that we have to be vigilant about um, setting boundaries to the extent we can say, you know, Hey all, thanks for being with us. In today's episode, we speak with Paula Davis, founder and CEO of the Stress Resilience Institute, helping organizations prevent burnout and build resilience. She's the author of Beating Burnout at Work, Why Teams Hold the Secret to Wellbeing and Resilience. The Financial Times recently included her book in its March Roundup of Best Business Books. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Oprah Magazine, the Washington Post, and many more. She's a contributor to Forbes Fast Company and Psychology Today. Her journey is one of self-awareness and empowerment. Having experienced burnout, she left a promising law career and started exploring the topics of well-being, burnout prevention, and stress management. She set forth on a mission to help individuals and organizations become more resilient. She's since trained thousands of professionals, leaders, and teams in many industries, including many of the world's largest law firms, plus worked with the military, training more than 40,000 soldiers and their family members. She's a walking testament of how, when we're attuned to ourselves, we can be the best versions of ourselves and make an impact on the world while at it. In addition to being inspired by her journey, this interview can help leaders identify burnout in their teams and gain practical tips on how to navigate it. And if you think that providing the likes of yoga classes for your team is the way to go, this will hopefully make you revisit that notion, as the solution goes way deeper than that and entails true awareness and devotion. I'll get out of your ear and let you dive into the episode. Real. Live. Superpowers. Superpowers. So Paula, welcome to Real Life Superpowers. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for our discussion. Yeah, we are as well. So what are you up to these days? I always add that and it always leads to really interesting places. So I have been on a crazy pace for a while. So I wrote my book all of last year while trying to sort through the, the pandemic and I have a five-year-old and um, you know all sorts of crazy life stuff happening. And then my book launched in March. And then there was a lot, you know, to do around, around all of that. So I honestly am trying to enjoy just a little bit of a slower pace because it has been a while. It's the summertime. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, now that, you know, we have, you know, restaurants and places that are open, at least here where I am in the States, um, you know, I'm having a chance to get together with my friends more and things like that. So I'm really trying to just enjoy that because it's very hard for me to kind of get that settled, slowed down feeling and, <laughs> and it, which is contrary to what I'm talking about. Um, I should say I need to follow my own advice in my book. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's really what I'm trying to do at least right now is just, just kind of enjoy the summertime a little bit. Sounds fun. And I'm guessing, you know, writing a book must've been a stressful process in itself. Well, it, it's interesting because it, It was for sure, but it was my first book. And so I didn't know what I didn't know. And so, you know, you get this set of deadlines and the deadlines were, were actually pretty tight. But as a former practicing lawyer, I'm used to, you know, last minute fire drills and issues yeah. and things like that and deadlines. And so, so I just sort of took it as it came and tried to plan my time accordingly. And, uh, you know, really became my second job. So I was doing that on the weekends while I was running my business and, and teaching and doing my workshops and things during the week. So yeah, talk about passion. It, it, you really, I mean, I learned so much during this process and it really has to be like something that you love and really want to talk about because you will literally be sitting with it and thinking about it for a very long time. How do you start writing a book? Like, what do, what do you do? What's the first thing? Like, I, I have a great idea of something, some, you know, the main message that I want to, I want to, I want to have a megaphone and talk, talk about with millions of people. But what do you do? Do you, do you, do you start with like writing it? Do you start with the end? Do you do a synopsis? Like, how do you, how do you attack that? There's so many different ways to approach that. And I think that, 
So for me, the genesis of my book actually started as my master's thesis. When I finished my law practice and went back and got my master's at UPenn in positive psychology, um, I had to write my master's thesis. And so my ideas were trying to, I was trying to galvanize around this concept of resilience and how to apply it at work. And I mean, I look back on my master's thesis and think, wow, like, how did you pass? Like, it was really <laughs> bad um, because my I had just been exposed to a topic um, and when you're thinking about it at that point versus when I write, when I wrote the book last year, having taught now and researched the topic for 10 years, you're at a very different point in time. And so I always encourage people, if you're thinking about writing a book, start putting your ideas out into the world in smaller doses. And that's oftentimes what I would start to do with all of the blogs that I, that I write on and, and some of my my other writing was just to test ideas, just to put some ideas out there that I knew I kind of was thinking about including in a framework for a book. I mean, I realized I had a lot to learn about my own topic. And so I'm glad I didn't get a chance to, I was approached a number of different times and different points in my business to potentially write a book on some resilience or stress related topic. And I'm glad those opportunities never came to fruition because it would never have been kind of this, this, this sort of point of in message that I really feel I finally for myself and my journey honed in on. So I always think about that at, you know, uh, anytime you can put your ideas or content in smaller doses out into the world, use them as a framework for your presentations and speaking and test them out with people. And, you know, if you're internal to an organization, maybe create a program and just, just get people's ideas about, about something. And that all of that helps you to really form, I think a very intentional and a very cohesive longer product. And then when it comes to the actual book itself, I just went in order. I, I didn't jump around chapters and I didn't start with the end. I just, I, I started with my story because it helped me to be able to process and get it out in a really specific way. Um, and I had had kind of done the outline with the proposal and had an idea of a roadmap of where I wanted to go and then just kind of took that in order. But I know everybody's creative process is different. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about that story that you just mentioned that led to all of this. Yeah. So I burned out during what became the last year of my law practice. And it was a very, um, it turned into a very scary period of time for me because I didn't, I didn't recognize the process that I was going through and I didn't recognize that it was called burnout. And I just uh, realized that I wasn't handling my stress in the same way. And I also realized that I had become phenomenally just checked out and disengaged with my work, which had never happened before. Very much somebody where work has always been something that's very important to me and, um, you know, a very important part of my life. And I couldn't figure out what was happening. I couldn't figure out why I didn't care about going into work, why I would start, you know, going in late, why I didn't want to have lunches or dinners with my colleagues like I used to, why people started to annoy me <laughs> and started to, you know, really just bother me, which is not my personality. Um, it was all of these factors kind of conspiring together that led me to, um, to, to a place where eventually my anxiety flared up. I started to get panic attacks on a very regular basis. I was in the emergency room twice because I had stomach aches, really bad stomach aches from the stress that I was experiencing. And it was um, really at that point, you know, I can remember sort of walking out of the emergency room for the second time thinking like, what is going on? And I'm willing to devote you know, a lot of myself to my work, but I'm not willing to sacrifice my health for it. And made me become a lot more serious about really figuring out what the next step was supposed to be. And so it turned into this really kind of this longer process of figuring out A, what was happening and then B, what am I supposed to do about it? And so for me, the answer became wanting to start my own business to help other people and just educate organizations and leaders and teams about what this is and what, what burnout looks like and what stress is and, and how we can potentially fix that. And it's really interesting, even on a meta level, because at the end of the day, uh, you not only stopped practicing law to pursue something else, but that's something that you were pursuing was to help others not reach where you were, which sort of makes me wonder if you were not doing what you're doing right now, could you potentially still be practicing law, but just, you know, being able to navigate it based on your own tools? Or do you feel like at the holistic level, the fact that you were doing something that maybe wasn't for you was causing it all? 
That's a fantastic question. A lot of people ask me that. They ask me it in different ways. And, and some people even ask me today, they're like, would you would you go back to practicing law? And my, my answer is always never say never, but it would have to be some really amazing stars aligned kind of a kind of a thing um, to, to really get me back into practicing. And I think that if I were, if I was to have gone back, it probably would have been in that period of time, right after I finished my master's degree, I ended up working with the United States military in the University of Pennsylvania, um, teaching a train the trainer program and resilience to senior non-commissioned officers and senior officers and, and folks in the military around building their own resilience and then teaching and training it to their lower ranking soldiers um, in their units. And that program turned out to be really phenomenal and really helped me start to be able to see how I could apply this to organizations and apply it in a larger way. Had that not happened, I don't know that I would have had enough runway to really get my business off the ground in the way that I would have wanted to. And so in, in those handful of couple of years right after my master's, I, you know, I think that could have been a realistic possibility for me to potentially have to go back to practicing law. I would have just chosen to do that. So um, knock on wood. And I always th thank the universe for sending me in a, in a different direction with it. But the highest and best use, I think, of my strengths is not practicing law. There's aspects of it that I think potentially are, but um, if you had asked me back in like high school or, you know, when I was younger, what do you want to be when you grow up? My answer was always, I want to teach. And I talked myself out of it for a whole host of reasons when I got to university. And so I've really circled back around to, to teaching really, um, but doing it in a way that resonates and makes sense for me. And so I think I'm, I'm using my strengths in the best way now with the work that I'm doing. That's amazing. And I know that you talk a lot about how teams and how dealing with burnout shouldn't be at the individual level. But I'm thinking probably many listeners are now asking themselves, am I burnt out? And yes, of course, also as an organization, you know, there's the, the people around you who are supposed to also help identify it in a healthy system. But how can people start off by basically just understanding either if they're burned out or if someone around them is? Yes. And that's a really important question for a whole host of reasons. And I think that the more more that we can move this conversation, not completely away from, from the individual intersection, because individuals will always have a role to play in, in the burnout process, but to, but to open it up so that we can really start to identify collectively within our systems, our teams, and our organizations, what burnout looks like, I think can only help. And so, so for folks who may be listening, um, burnout is really a cluster of three big dimensions. It is um, and it's all chronic. So that's an important word to know. So just because you're feeling tired one day or you're in the middle of a big project and you're kind of dragging a little bit or you don't feel dis you feel a little disengaged for a handful of time at work doesn't necessarily mean you're burned out. So it's this more often than not process of feeling chronically, physically and emotionally exhausted. And so for me and a lot of the people who I talk to, they talk about they call it like the Sunday scaries. For some people, they're like, it starts for me on Saturday morning, um, you know, where you have this kind of dread about uh, Monday's coming and I got to go to work. And and it's it's something that tends to, you know, you, you sort of have that feeling, you know, weekend after weekend. So that chronic physical and emotional exhaustion. So nothing that you do, your, your typical stress management strategies and things that you would do to get some vitality and engagement aren't working or have stopped working. For a period of time again. Um, and then it's it's a, a sense of chronic cynicism. So that's that everybody annoys you and bothers you and you don't you just don't want to be around people. You kind of disconnect from wanting to interact with people and especially the people who you feel called or tasked to serve or to help. So if you're in the healthcare profession, you might feel a sense of disengagement from your patients or your colleagues. For me as a lawyer, I started to feel really disengaged from my clients to the point where they would really annoy me, which is a bad mentality to take into like a really serious negotiation or some of the work that I was doing. And oftentimes, I mean, outwardly, I was always very professional, but inwardly, a lot of eye rolling going on, a lot of thinking to myself like, oh, can you just figure this out on your own? Do you really need my help with this? You're not going to listen to my advice anyway. So why are we having this conversation? That sort of mentality starts to become a lot more prevalent. 
Then it leads to the third big dimension or warning sign, which is a sense of um, the research calls inefficacy. I just think of it as the why bother, who cares, the sort of lost impact. What am I doing? Is this really what I want to be doing? Is there something different or better for me? And it doesn't have to mean leaving your job and oftentimes doesn't for people. It's just, is this role or function what I'm supposed to be doing? Or do I feel, you know, like maybe there's something else for me. And so if you notice those three pieces kind of cropping up again, more often than not, that's one of the best indicators to, for you to say, okay, my stress, the stress that I have been experiencing just generally because, you know, work, work, work is stressful has turned into something different, has turned into something that probably looks a little bit more like burnout. And I always tell folks too that burnout exists on a spectrum. And so sometimes it's kind of hard to see in other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I always felt like I was really good at hiding it until, you know, I started to get toward the end stages of it. But You know, it's, I started coming into work 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later as a lawyer, I didn't really have a start time, but it became noticed by other people on my team that I was coming in quite a bit later than other people were starting. So that was, you know, if, if you're savvy as a leader or as, as a team member, and you start to notice that you shouldn't jump to conclusions necessarily, but if you notice that, you know, consistently, that could be, that could be something I started to decline invitations for lunches. You know, when our team would have holiday parties, I would show up late and I would leave early. That started to get noticed. Sometimes people just, you know, would mention something about like, wow, you just seem a little tense today or you seem a little cranky, um, which is not my normal personality at all. And so it's those little things that you start to notice about people that, you know, I think sometimes in our busyness, especially as leaders, it's hard right? Because we're, we're just in the middle of so much stuff. We have to slow ourselves down enough to pick up on some of these more subtle cues that people are, that people are displaying. So, so it's a, it's a process. This is like a question for the entrepreneurs out there, because an entrepreneur, um, uh, one of the things that you're talking about, like benchmarking when you're getting there, as opposed to other people in the same same, you know, career, um, as an entrepreneur, uh, you necessarily have your own self as a boss. So you need a lot of uh, resilience or a lot of, um, uh, um, uh, mindfulness to do what you need to be done. Meaning the question here is the, actually two things. One, as an entrepreneur, you can't benchmark. So burnout, even if you're burned out, you have no choice because you have to be self-reliant on that. So when you define that, like what can you do? And the second thing is, even if you define that, how do you isolate, which sounds to me like the biggest problem, and I'm really intrigued on that. How do you identify the differentiation between burnout but you know it's from the job and there's no external factors that are burning out. Um, and it's not only the job, meaning there could be relationships or friendships or grief or anything else that you are in burnout in the job, but it's not just opposed to, am I in the right place? What am I doing? It's a lot of things together. So how do you isolate that? Yeah. So these are great questions. And so I think about this myself a lot as a business owner, and I have conversations with other entrepreneurs and in business, my business owner colleagues about this quite frequently. And it's really difficult because when you are your own boss, And especially a lot of entrepreneurs, we love what we do, right? That's why we're doing it and we're doing it in this format and it's hard to turn off. And so we have to be careful around, you know, when you identify that things that that brings you so much meaning and brings you so much passion and you want to keep doing it and you, you get so excited and you're out there building and generating new ideas and doing things that you can still crash and burn. So oftentimes we think about like meaning and, and passion for our work as, you know, once you have that, you will never work a day in your life. And that's that's empirically and anecdotally false. And so, so recognizing that, that we can be our own worst enemies as entrepreneurs and that we have to be vigilant about um, setting boundaries and uh, to the extent we can say no. And I totally, I'm, I'm talking this through with you and kind of smiling at the same time, because what I'm telling, what I'm saying to do is also things that I find really hard to do that intuitively, I know I have to do them, but at the same time, it's me running a business. So it's, it's, you know, I, I can't not say yes to somebody who wants to hire me potentially, at least that's what I tell myself. Uh, and so, so for me, I have to be really vigilant about some of those things, but also identifying resources that I might not be taking advantage of. So when we think about burnout, 
it's caused by a pretty simple equation, which is your demands exceed your resources. Your job demands exceed your job resources. So um, your job demands are things that just take consistent effort and energy about your work. And your resources are things that you find motivational or helpful or energy giving about your work. So I find that when I'm pushing myself really hard or I'm in a space where I'm just, you know, going through a lot of work and a lot of stuff is happening, I have to really lean on my resources. And that might be, um, I realized a couple of years ago, I need to get a virtual assistant. Like I need to start adding people to my team because I'm taking on too much stuff and I have to figure out the right structure to do that. But but at some point, you have to realize that you can't just do it all yourself and that there has to be an expansion of roles because now that's not good for, for growth, for business growth either, is when, when you, know, you as the CEO are sending out invoices, perhaps when somebody else should be doing that so your time is spent in a different way. And so it's thinking about, do I have the right systems in place? Do I have the right people in place? Am I using my strengths? Am I... Am I sort of focused on the highest and best use of my time and strategies. And when I find that the answer is no to those things for a while, I have to take a step back and figure out how I can start to, to sort of implement the right system to support me. Because it can't just be me putting my head down and go, go, go. And so kind of to the, the second point of what you were talking about, um, there's a lot to unpack with that. Um, but burnout specifically is identified as an occupational phenomenon. So part of where we go wrong with the burnout conversation is we, we say it or apply it as almost an interchangeable word with stress. And then we say everything is like, I, I'm just feeling so burned out. I'm burned out in my relationship or I'm you know burned out as a parent or what have you. And it's not necessarily the wrong application, but it, it's usually just not, not the best. <laughs> it's not the right term oftentimes for what we're feeling and experiencing. And we know, though, even though that burnout is has a workplace root or an occupational root to it, and even the World Health Organization, when they updated their definition a couple of years ago, specified that, that when we're talking about burnout, we're talking about something with an occupational or workplace root to it. But we also know from the research, research that there's things called crossover and spillover effects, so that stress from home and other areas or domains of our life can come with us to work. And the same thing in reverse, right? If, we, if we're burned out at work, I can certainly tell you that I didn't show up as the best version of myself at home and with my family and with the people who, you know, my friends and things like that. So, so it, it doesn't all come in this nice, nice, neat package. There are other facets and areas of our life that add could add fuel to the fire. If you're going through a breakup or a difficult you know, time in a relationship, and you're also feeling disengaged from work, that's going to have a combined impact for sure. And so we just have to kind of tease apart and talk about, you know, what is the burnout piece and what's causing that and what might be stress from another area or another aspect of our lives. So it's it presents this sort of this messy sort of interchange, but that's how I hope or I, I like to have people think about it, that, that when we're talking about burnout, we're really focused on something that is specific to work or, you know, related to our job on some level. So I don't know if that gets to your questions, because there's a lot of different ways to go with that. But that's that's kind of how I think about both of those pieces. That definitely does. When you found that definition, you, you know what it is to burn out. Like, what was like the key thing? thought process to get out of that because on a stealing fire book uh Stephen Kotler with Stephen Kotler it would be trying to get your brain out of that you know that loop of everydayness but like what, what would be the trick to say okay I can see I'm in that situation but how do I think clearly how do I stand back and say what's the action item really like the tangible action item that I can do in that second yeah and so so it's hard it's hard to answer that question in terms of what could I do in this second, because burnout is oftentimes such a long process that's been happening. It's not like a split second, something that's going to get you out of it. Like not a panic attack. Exactly. So you get the warning signs that are giving you indicators that, whoa, wait a second, there's something else going on here. I might have to start thinking about the fact that I am burning out. Then what does that mean? Right. And so it could mean. So for me, actually, my first inclination was not to leave the law practice. I went to my boss, who was phenomenal. And I didn't even have the language of burnout at the time. And so I was just trying to tell him as best as I could how I was feeling and what was going on. And I said, you know what? So I practiced commercial real estate law. And I said, you know what? I'm, I'm really just sort of tired of doing the same type of 
like lease or purchase agreement or negotiation, like over and over again, is there something different in the legal department? I was in a corporate legal department that I could work on because I'm really interested in other areas of the law. Could I take on other projects and reduce my workload with the commercial real estate stuff? And he said, sure, let me, let me just, you know, kind of run it up the chain of command and see what happens. And the, 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 the powers that be above him did not want me to be doing anything other than real estate deals. And so that stunk because I felt like I had a solution and the door was closed. How lucky. Exactly. Right. And then I thought about going back to the firm that I had practiced at because, you know, it was, there's nothing wrong with it. They loved me. I, you know, it was a, it was a decent place to be. And, um, and then that didn't work for, for a number of different reasons. And so, so for, for people, first of all, at some point is going to have to be, I've got to say something about it because burnout is just going to keep progressing until the root causes are addressed and so it might be, could, could I be reassigned to a new team? I talk to and coach people who will say to me, I think I need like a month or a three month sabbatical. And then we'll put a plan in place for them to talk to their supervisor about, can that happen? Um, for some people, it is, you know, just switching to a different role within the same organization. Some people want to maybe go to a different organization. Other people, I'm, I'm more often the exception to the rule than the rule, will actually transition out of the work that they're doing and do something completely different. So, so there's lots of different stages and things that you have to sort of ask yourself and look at. But I will tell you, uh, there's a lot of individual work that has to happen too. Sort of like, I think anytime something big like that happens in your life, you kind of have to take a step back and ask like, what did I contribute to this? Because, mm-hmm. it, you know, I talk about in the book how it's a systems issue, but I'm also part of the system. So there, there is an individual component to it. Mm-hmm. And we oftentimes hear the wrong sort of remedy. We hear things like, well, go yoga or meditate or you know, go for a walk or things like that. And those are phenomenal baseline stress management strategies. But when you're burned out, you have to go really deep and and ask yourself, like, what am I bringing to the table? And I realized, you know, wow, I'm a people pleaser. I'm an achievaholic. Uh, I like to put my head down. I'll go for hours. Um, You know, I don't build in a lot of self-care practices. Um, I'm a perfectionist. And so I have to figure out what that's about. So there was a lot of, you know, self-awareness work that I had to do around, you know, how I think in stressful situations and what I'm bringing to the table. Um, And that's helped me tremendously. And it's not like those qualities get erased, but I have a better understanding of how to deal with them and handle them. And so when I work, when I get a chance to work one-on-one with folks, that's oftentimes where we go. We start to start to work on some of that that deeper self-reflection, um, you know, resilience and other um, tools and things like that to help people identify what is it about my makeup that's also contributing to what's going on here. That sounds phenomenal self-awareness. And it seems even more challenging at a time when you're literally burned out, uh, not to mention that burnout will come along with stress. So, A, wow, that's amazing that you were able to sort of self-cure in that sense. And I'm thinking... How did you have the courage? You were you were working in a promising law career. How did you have the courage to just walk away? I mean, it, it must have been beyond that self-awareness unless, you, no, you tell me. So, yeah, so I come from an entrepreneurial family and I knew at some point in my life, I wanted to own my own business. And so I figured that I would have a legal career into my 50s or beyond, and then I would do something entrepreneurial. That was That was sort of the plan. Uh, And then I realized that maybe I was being given an opportunity to to do that in a completely different way in a much earlier part of my career. And um, and again, it wasn't intuitive. I didn't get to that point first. I looked at other paths and options and then that didn't work. And then the as soon as I settled on, okay. I'm, I'm going to start a business, then that was that was one question answer. But then it was like, what am I going to start my business in? Uh, and it was just a process of going through and, and identifying. And I put in the book, you, you read that I you know, was going to be a pastry chef. And then that, yeah. I did my, my week long internship and hated every minute of it and realized that is not what I am supposed to be doing. But wait, 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 stop there. Hang on, because this is really interesting. And I think that's a key point. You were working yeah. as a prestigious lawyer mm-hmm. and you were feeling burned out. You didn't even know that's the terminology, but you were feeling that something is off and that you need to make a change. And then 
How does one go from that to working, you know, as in a pastry? Oh, yeah, it was just completely random. It was it was me thinking, okay, if, if it's not a law career, what do I love to do? That's that was the question that I asked myself. What it, what what do I love to do? That's really all I asked myself. And the first thing that came to mind was well, I love throwing dinner parties. I love baking. Uh, you know, and all of that. So I'm like, that's what I'll do. And I, you know, you don't get coached or have classes and figuring this stuff out in your life. And so that's just kind of where I started. But did people think you went crazy? No, actually there's, um, and maybe it was because I'm in the legal profession. And I think a lot of lawyers just generally harbor a, <laughs> a, like a secret of like, can I get out at some point? Um, no, they, they didn't. And I think it was because they saw that I was kind of suffering on some level and, um, you know, it's like kind of whatever you need to do to sort of fix that, go, go ahead. So I, I never had anybody stop me and say, this is silly. Like, what are you thinking? Like, are you sure? Um, well, I don't know if that's good or bad, but, <laughs> but it didn't happen. And so I think it's, it's inspiring, um, but I was thankful, but thank goodness. Cause I had applied to the French culinary Institute in New York and I was accepted and I was going to be moving to, New York. I don't know what I was thinking quite honestly. And I, um, I wanted to try it out first. And so that's how the internship came about. My brother was living in San Francisco at the time. And um, there was a restaurant near where he lived and he knew the owners and they said, we'll have her just come in and we could use the help. And so I thought, awesome, I'm going to love this. And this is going to be fabulous. And I knew within two hours of doing it, that this was not lovely and fabulous and what I wanted to do. Uh, and so thank goodness I tried it because otherwise I would have gone monumentally down the wrong road and spent a lot of money at culinary school. And then who knows what I would have done after that. So I think having the courage to try something, but then also having the courage to go, uh, uh, this isn't, this isn't right either, um, was helpful, but then it really sunk me. That's my, my burnout really took a turn for the worse after the failed pastry internship experience. <laughs> Um, cause I was still practicing law. I took a week of vacation just to go out to San Francisco and do this. And so I thought I'd come back and leave and it would all be good. And I had to completely start back at square one. Um, and that's when I started to get more of the anxiety and the panic attacks and things like that. And really, honestly, had it not been for the fact that I was in the emergency room twice really was the brick. I think that had to hit me to say like, you can't sacrifice your health regardless, no matter what you do. And so that was really, for me, the, the biggest pause to say, wait a second, like something really has to change. Something really has to shift because you're going to just run yourself into the ground if, if it doesn't. And so, um, so yeah, I ended up, it was very interesting. I ended up hiring a coach because I thought I, I can't sort this out on my own. I need, I don't even know who to hire, but I'm going to hire somebody. And I hired a person who I was in the airport and I picked up an issue of success magazine. And it was a woman who had written an article and I, I don't even remember what it was about. And I saw her bio and she said, she's a coach. And so I like emailed her and I, and she had just, she was just finishing the master's in applied positive psychology program at Penn. And so I said, what is positive psychology? My undergrad is in psychology. Like, this is amazing. And she explained it to me. And I, I, I just, I knew I was like, okay, this is, this sounds amazing. This is what I'm going to do. This is, this is where the answers lie for me. And so that the rest as they say is history. And did it feel like it's exactly that, that the stars just basically aligned as soon as that you, you realized that? Yeah. As soon as I discovered that there was a body of psychology, a science of psychology called positive psychology, because there wasn't when I, when I graduated from my undergrad, the, the different sciences that go into the umbrella called positive psychology have existed for many, many, many decades. Resilience is one of the bodies of science that is under the positive psychology right. umbrella. That's been studied for a long time. Right. And so, um, so, so knowing that I could uh, get a degree in something like that and, and have an empirical basis for teaching something to other people was really the key in what, in what I had been looking for and not finding in other things that I was, that I was doing. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was literally, I mean, it, there was, as soon as I got to the, and I didn't really, I mean, I didn't go to the program thinking I'm going to study resilience. I didn't, I just went there thinking, this is a program that's going to give me a lot of basis to create the thing that I'm going to create. And so I kept an open mind as the program happened. And when we got to the piece about, 
you know, resilience. I didn't even really know what that was. I mean, I kind of did, but I didn't know that there were skills associated with it. And I, and it was when we started to, to uncover that I went, wow, like if I had had some of this, like when I was practicing law, like, poof, you know, I, I, maybe I still would have burned out, but I would have been able to help myself in a different way. And so, so once I, once I zeroed in on that area of science, that, that has not left me. I think that um, many people now are more familiar with positive psychology thanks to that TED talk that went viral by Dr. Martin Zeligman, right? Yes, Marty um, had a TED talk. Angela Duckworth was one of my professors, so she does all the wow. work on, on grit. And Adam yeah. Grant, this was before Adam Grant was, you know, kind of, he was one of my professors for a, a little segment of one of my, um, one of my classes. And so, uh, you know, to really be learning some very interesting science as it's happening and really kind of cutting edge and, and being able to think about how to apply some of these concepts to the workplace and teams and things like that was really was really a cool spot to be in. Amazing. I've heard all of them speak and hearing it like firsthand and sort of seeing it come together must have been really empowering. It was fantastic. And the other thing, I mean, the, I mean you, you just talk about how when you start to identify what you're meant to do, there's just things that line up for you. Yeah. And, and I would never have had the opportunity to do the work with the army that I had, had I not, you know, kind of gone through the master's program at that time, because they were just developing this huge initiative. Um, Penn was with the United States army to teach and train drill sergeants and soldiers in the skills of resilience that had never happened before. Uh, you know, talking about resilience and applying like positive psychology at that large of a scale was something that hadn't happened before. And so to see how that happened and how that unfolded and how to scale something like that and be able to teach it to other people, especially a very tough population, um, was, was a phenomenal opportunity. I mean, that was worth as much as, you know, the actual classroom learning to be able to be exposed to that as well. I'm sure we had a guest who was telling us that she felt that once you understand what your vocation is, suddenly it's like you're driving through the road with, and it's all green lights. <laughs> it is, but it takes, it's not all green lights right away. It's like, yeah. you sort of have to just kind of keep walking toward it. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to, whatever the it is, you, you really just have to have kind of the courage and the perseverance to, um, to keep saying, oh, okay, that sounds really amazing. How do I get to that? that point, right? And then I'm going to do the work that it has that I have to put in in order to make that green light happen because that's a really key component of it. It's not just that the green lights appear, it's that I'm doing the work to actively get closer to the green light to turn it on so that I can take advantage of whatever that opportunity is going to be. So yes, I, that's a I love that. I feel like there are some uh, there's probably so many missed opportunities in the world by miserable lawyers who just aren't like miserable enough. I remember I, I, I heard Peter Thiel from PayPal. Uh, I think it was in his book or I read him in an interview, but he was saying like he was in a really prestigious law firm. I think he was a partner even. And one day he was like just he left and he was walking with that cardboard box down the hall. And he said that, you know, people you know, were looking at him and they seemed so jealous. And somebody asked him, how are you how are you doing this? And he just said, I'm just lucky to be miserable enough to not be able to stay. Yes. What, what do you think it is about law practice that makes people so uncomfortable? And, and just to say, guilty of being one. Uh, uh, so I share the sentiment, but I'm not able to uncover exactly why it's so horrible. No offense, lawyers. <laughs> so first of all, I think that, and sometimes I think people are surprised to hear me say this, but when I talk to lawyers, I always say that lawyers play such an important role in our society. We, we deal with and usher people and organizations through the most critical, complicated, life-altering challenges that they will face. And we don't talk like that though. We don't, we don't bring that up in our profession and we don't talk about the impact I think that we make nearly enough. But the problem is, is that we are taught to think like lawyers. So we're taught to issue spot. We're taught to challenge. We're, we're taught to make an argument. We're taught to poke holes in what somebody says. We're taught to always think about who's at fault and who's to blame and the downside of something in service of helping steer our clients away from whatever the bad issue is. And what happens is it's a thinking style and we get so good at it because we're practicing it 10, 12, 14 hours a day, every day. 
that it becomes the default way that we start to see the world. So, you know, when, you, when you're having a, an interaction with your significant other, you poke holes in it, you get argumentative, you challenge them, you debate them. And that's not the way most people are trained. And so it's off-putting to a lot of people and annoying to sort of have that kind of, you know, response coming back at them. But, you know, you're in an adversarial environment. It's oftentimes a zero sum game where you have a winner and a loser, and that's hard. Uh, you know, young lawyers don't have a lot of autonomy or flexibility. Um, the, the structures in place, I think at a lot of, you know, law firms at least are very hierarchical. They're very old school. Um, you know, the legal profession doesn't really change with the times very quickly. Uh, you know, we, we have to keep track of our time in six minute increments if you're working in a firm, which is annoying. Uh, you know, there's I think there's just a whole host of. I would think as, as first that it's just an expectancy, it's selling it as law and order and seeing it so exciting and seeing litigation and everything and then understanding that you're actually doing how you said and put it, um, you're doing the commercial real estate again and again in the lease itself, that it becomes repetitive and you're not having that impact because I think the selling point on that and accounting and a few other professions are, are selling you something that only few people are lucky enough to actually feel and usually those lucky people have the context to bring the business inside the firm so you know you know there's a sentence saying if you work very hard you have no time to make money so the lawyer itself i think it's just because the lawyers themselves expect them to have these exciting you know impacts and at the end of the day it's just make as few mistakes as possible you'll be okay because um i'm like i, I say that on a point where i see a lot of pressures you know just you know, kind of having this illusion. And then, you know, seeing that you say hierarchy by say, there's a lot of people not trying to try not to make mistakes. And there's a king and a queen and maybe a prince and a, a princess, but that's about all anything can handle. And usually their names on the door. So that, that that's on my perspective. I think that like, and I'm not a lawyer, but I just hear a lot of lawyers uh, say things about it. So I think that's one of the things that, that, that the illusion itself, they don't tell you how to be a great lawyer and it usually has nothing to do with how good a lawyer you are it's how good a business development or creative thinker you are or you are very charismatic and good teamwork which is good for any kind of business but those things on on that sense but but i'm really intrigued in the resilience like i get the word but how do i practice resilience like what is the the idea of getting better at resilience like so when you think about resilience, the definition of it and what it is holds true, regardless of whether you're talking about it really at the organizational level, the team level, or the individual level. And it's just, it's really two components. And I think this is another area because um, we hear the word resilience so much now. And it's, it's uh, I, I don't still think that, I think we oftentimes don't quite understand necessarily fully what it is. And we, we hear about it in kind of the wrong way or a different way. And so it's really a couple of different components. If you're talking about resilience, you're talking about a response to adversity, stress, challenge, change, uncertainty, setback, failure, something in that realm or in that universe. Um, and so we all experience that individually. Our teams do, especially now in the world of work, because it's changing. It's complex. It's, there's a ton of uncertainty right now, especially, you know, in the middle of the pandemic and, you know, country by country, it's a different, you know, sort of response, um, you know, and, you know, as, as work continues to go in that direction, I think that's why you see so many companies who have resilience as like a core value, or they're placing a lot of emphasis on it, because you have to have teams and people who understand or know how to meet those challenges, right? When I get, when I have a challenge or experience a setback, do I, persevere? Do I persist? Do I pivot? How do I adapt? Can I do it quickly? Because I've got a lot of stuff coming at me. And so it's that first piece of, you know, just really being able to uh, adapt and navigate through that swirl of whatever it is that you've just experienced in service of not just bouncing back, but the second big piece about resilience is bouncing forward. So how do I grow from that? I just went through a something. My team just experienced 
this, this thing at work and we had a lot of challenges, we finally made it through, what did we learn from it? How are we now going to take the lessons that we learn and apply them to future challenges going forward? And it's one of the thing that, things that concerns me right now about a lot of the response that I see to the pandemic is, are we, how, what, are, what did we learn in the last year and a half? Uh, are we going to apply those lessons? How are we going to apply those lessons to how we want to work going forward? Are we going to do that? Are we just going to go back to the way it was and tell people this is what we're going to do? We're going to be back in the office five days a week. Are we going to experiment with something different? Do we think that's going to work? What about our culture? What do we need to tweak? And so those are the types of questions that I encourage companies and teams to be having right now. But that's really what it is. It's those two things. And recognizing that you can build muscles. So a, a lot of people, I think, sometimes falsely think, especially at the individual level, that resilience is just something you're born with, right? You either have it or you don't. And we portray it out in the media, in the world, as it's this superhuman thing that people have to accomplish these great feats of challenge. And, um, it, and it is, I mean, it can be. So it's our, it can be our response to really huge adversities, but it's also our response to just the everyday stuff and challenges that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And so it's both of those things. Um, and recognizing that you have the ability to kind of build the muscles to increase your ability to be able to meet those challenges in a better way, in a healthier way, in a quicker way, I think is really, um, is really important. And so that's, that's kind of where my model comes in, in my book. I wanted to figure out from a team standpoint, what does that look like? What are the capacities and things that we have to start focusing on and looking at? And that's where my primed model came from. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense, um, which probably also make it intuitive for people that you coach and sort of get exposed to what your findings are to, to, to understand and apply. Uh, and have, having read the book, I also know, you know, that you're very practical and you give like very precise advice uh, and, and tips on what people can do and as organizations and individuals to navigate this and, you know, come out stronger. Like, do you want to maybe give a few teasers, I'll say, or sort of like a few quick tips that people can and sort of understand and apply and, and, and see the potential here? Sure. Um, and I think it's really important to emphasize, and this is, I think, one of the things that is somewhat frustrating about resilience, because in our, in our big, in our, in our, like, I just want an answer sort of culture and tell me something I can do quick. Um, resilience is a practice. So you don't just do the things that I'm about to tell you. You don't just do them once mm -hmm. and expect to see that you're going to have a resilient team or that you individually are going to develop resilience. When I say that I have my own resilience practice, it's like all the time, if I find myself thinking in a counterproductive way or overthinking something, I have to revert back to a skill that I know to help myself remember how to practice to get myself out of that, mm -hmm. that type of thinking style. And so it's, it's the regular application and practice of these skills, but there's a whole host of things that are important. One, one big one for teams to be thinking about it and individuals to um, at work is to kind of be able to track your sense of progress. So recognizing the ways in which you are, um, I call them small successes or small wins, almost down to the check, checking off my to-do list types of stuff, right? We don't think in those terms. And so we don't realize how much progress we're actually making on a project in our role within the organization, because we don't think in those small increments, but, but having that sense of um, tracking your small successes and wins, and then being able to, to share that. So encouraging teams to, to really be talking about the ways in which they are finding success, especially during challenging times and in challenging projects, is the thing that makes me go, Oh yeah, you're right. Okay, I can roll out of bed again tomorrow and tackle this because this is this is this is really difficult. This thing that we're going through. Um, so just knowing that and, and starting to implement conversations about that is important. Um, if you're a leader, being accessible and approachable, acknowledging the limits of your own knowledge, and I can't reinforce that enough. How much that builds trust within teams. And it's counterintuitive for leaders. When I tell them this, they don't believe me because they think if I tell my team, I don't know something, they're going to think I'm not an effective leader. And it's actually the opposite. 
So it's getting leaders to understand uh, you, you can't walk into a meeting every day and say you don't know something. But but if you really honestly haven't seen an issue before, which comes up a lot, we're dealing with so many different complex Uncertain. global yeah, uncertain issues right now. You can't know everything. I, I, you can't tell me you know how to get out of the pandemic because we've never experienced this before. And so, so telling people, I don't know, this is new for all of us. What do we think? How can we approach this together? Creates a lot of trust and creates a lot of buy-in because I know you're BSing me if you try to tell me that you know the answer to something that nobody knows the answer to. So, so helping helping people recognize that um, anytime that you can talk about within your team or or share collectively a story about you know overcoming a challenge and you don't have to you know talk about the biggest challenge you've ever experienced but you know even keeping it at the workplace you know level talking about how important it is to have overcome a difficult project or you know working with a potentially difficult client helps me now understand like oh cool like it's all right like i'm i'm dealing with stress too i don't have to i don't have to feel like i'm the only one who's who's doing that. Um, you know, I think the other thing I talk about, especially for leaders too, is anytime that you can, um, like provide an extra explanation or rationale for a project. So I hear this in a lot of industries, especially with, you know, newer professionals, they're just given assignments and things and told to do them because they're the, they're the low person or they're, they're the person you just gotta, you know, kind of deal with, deal with it instead, um, framing it as, Here's a project. Here's a little background about our client. Here's why this is important. Um, here's why I'm asking you to do this. Here's the purpose of this. Anytime you can give that extra sort of explanation or rationale for a project, it invites autonomy. It invites um, me thinking like, oh, okay, I have a sense of flexibility. You've given me enough information to make decisions about something. Now I can proceed in a way that makes sense for me. So, so that transparency, that clarity, making sure people know that what their role is, um, the explanations piece is, is all really important. So all of those things are examples. Right. And what would you say your superpower is? I love that question. So I, I operate by three core values and they have come up for me for different reasons at different points in my life. But I would say the one superpower or core value that's always kind of been consistently part of my orientation is kindness. And it was a struggle for me practicing law, having that as kind of my lead huh. superpower or strength, because I never felt I could really use be, it the yeah. way I wanted to. Is it legal to be kind? <laughs> no. No, right, right. I can't go into a negotiation and be like, hi, and be, you know, like. I understand what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and I've realized, I think, um, just how much I really need to express that. Cause it's, it's honestly, I think of all the, the superpowers or strengths that I might bring to the table, it's, it's the one that's most inherently me. And I find too, that if I'm going through a tough time in my life, it's the one thing that if I pay most attention to will help me feel the best. Anytime I can start to activate that helps to neutralize a lot of the other stress and pressure and things that I'm feeling in other areas of my life. So, um, so kindness, I would say is, is the big one. But wait, you said three things. Yeah. So the other, the second one would be courage. And so it is the hardest of my core values or superpowers to practice by far. Um, but I try to just keep walking toward challenges and recognizing I, I love Brene Brown's work in this space. And I just find that she always talks about like, um, so being in the arena, mm -hmm. I find that if I'm in the arena, I'm at least showing up and trying to do hard things and have challenging conversations and push myself to understand more and being the person who's willing to say the thing that nobody else wants to say those types of things, if I can keep doing that, then I feel like I'm still kind of in the arena, but it's, it's hard because it requires vulnerability and that's not easy for most people. So, so that's one. And then the third one is love. And that came about when my daughter was born. So my daughter is adopted. And so we went through the process of adopting her. She's five. And so we, we adopted her as a newborn. And so for me, like just really recognizing that, um, 
you know, out of the billions of people on the planet, like we somehow found each other. And that's like pretty cool and pretty amazing. And really talk about stars aligning, huh? Talk about the stars aligning. I mean, that's a whole other podcast that we could ha- we could have a long conversation about. And yes. um, just realizing how um, like how much I hadn't been focusing, I think, a lot on on love and how she just sort of kicked open the door to that and and caused me to sort of think in a new way and look at the world in a new way and interact with people in a new way um, and how healing love in a lot of different forms could be um, is is super important. So those are the three. Thank you for sharing that. And I have a feeling like I know what your kryptonite is because maybe it's also your superpower, but what would you say your kryptonite is? So, so kindness can also be right. part of my kryptonite, right? And, and oftentimes I think that's the case for a lot of people. Our biggest superpower is it can also yeah. be part of our undoing. And, and so I do have to work sometimes at like, you know, saying no to somebody. To me, that feels phenomenally unkind sometimes, but it's the thing that I need to put the right boundary in place. But it's challenging. So then I need my courage, right? And so that's how courage then kind of helps helps me and, and shows up. But um, but I I also have to, I've always been somebody who's very driven and I, I still have to make sure that I'm prioritizing like myself and putting the right self-care practices and boundaries in place for myself, um, you know, which is always a work in progress. I'm much better at it than I was 10 years ago, but that's also something um, that I have to watch <laughs> and pay attention to. And and speaking about 10 years ago, um, I know it's a cliche question. I'm sorry, but where do you see, see yourself then in 10 years? Hopefully I'll still be doing this work. I, I love it. Um, I'm sure it'll look a little different and it'll be taking some different shapes and forms and um, oh boy, just, you know, having a, having a, a, a good family and um, I, you know, I want to say maybe not working as hard as what I am right now, but I, I know myself too well to know that that's probably not going to be the case. Um, you know, just being able to en- enjoy life and, you know, Lucy will be 15. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, and just being there for her a lot and supporting her and, um, yeah. Thank you. I, I want to say, I also, I already told you this before, but now we're recording and I want to say that again. I've really enjoyed your book. I think anybody in any organization or entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, uh, people need to be more aware of this topic. And what I liked about your book is that it doesn't stay at the high level. Like it's super practical. And I know I'm reading a good book when I'm making notes uh, in my iPhone and I'm sitting down and I'm sort of just writing down sentences that I want to return to in the future, uh, whether to use contextually or just for myself to remember. And my my phone is packed with such notes, whether it's about tips like debriefing as teams. And I don't want to spoil, so I want people to read the book. But I want to say <laughs> I highly recommend it. And I think what you're doing is so important. And I just hope as many people as possible will read your book and also follow you. Um, where can people find you uh, to reach out to you or to find your book? Can you tell us a bit? Yeah, so the best place to find find all things about my book and my work and what I'm doing is at my website, which is stress and which is spelled out. So stress and resilience.com. So you'll find everything there, but um, also follow me on LinkedIn. That's generally my, my social media, you know, avenue of choice. And so that's where I'm usually posting my new Forbes articles or fast company articles or things like that. So, um, so either one of those places would be a good place for folks to start. Perfect. Perfect. And I hope that people will indeed do exactly that. So thank you so much for doing this and keep on rocking. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you both. Real life. Superpowers. Superpowers.